Hi, I'm Sean Munger, That History Guy, and welcome back to Bond in Context. We're investigating the historical context of the James Bond movies. We come now to the next entry in the film series, Diamonds Are Forever. I have to say that I'm biased in this regard. Diamonds Are Forever is my all-time favorite James Bond film. It's not the best, far from it, but it is my favorite, uh, even despite its very problematic homophobia, which I'm going to be talking about in a minute. But this movie is like comfort food. Uh, when I'm feeling bad, I watch Diamonds Are Forever. It's campy, it's ridiculous, but uh, it's quite endearing and endlessly entertaining. The year 1970, when the film was starting production, was a very difficult time. Uh, during this year, as the producers scrambled to find a new James Bond, uh, U.S. President Richard Nixon bombed and invaded Cambodia, thus escalating the Vietnam War and causing catastrophic protest reactions at home, culminating uh, most notably in the massacre of unarmed students at Kent State University in Ohio. In June 1970, there was an election in the UK. The result was a surprise. The Labour government of Prime Minister Harold Wilson was narrowly defeated by the Conservative Party, and Edward Heath became the new Prime Minister. The beginning of Heath's administration was rocky. Unemployment in Britain was rising at this time, along with political and social tensions. The year prior, 1969, had seen the beginnings of what came to be known as the Troubles, which was a campaign of terrorism in Britain by the Irish Republican Army, which lasted almost 30 years. The year 1971 was absolutely pivotal in world history, and almost no one realizes it. When I taught my university-level course on the history of climate change, I focused on the events of 1971 uh, as very important to that story. A major economic shift occurs in 1971, and it coincides with a major environmental shift, an amazing convergence of absolutely world-shaking events. And uh, this uh, coincides at the time that Diamonds Are Forever was being made and the time that it came out. So the economic shift involves money. Both Britain and the United States reorganized their currency systems during 1971. What's called the decimalization of British currency went into effect in February of 1971, abolishing the weird kind of semi-medieval system of money that had existed before, tuppence and stuff like that. This sounds trivial, I know, but actually de decimalization was a necessary prerequisite to the reform of London's stock exchange and financial markets, an event which wasn't completed until 15 years later, 1986, sometimes called the Big Bang, which ultimately led to London becoming a world financial center. In the United States in 1971, President Richard Nixon took the United States off the gold standard, an event abhorred by generations of libertarians ever since. Uh, but in reality, it made a lot of sense at the time because it allowed the American dollar to float meaning that its value fluctuates depending on market forces. Uh, you hear terms now like the strength of the dollar, things like that. That's where this started. One of the reasons why Nixon did this was to try to shore up a major trade deficit. In 1971, for the first time since World War II, the United States was importing more than it exported. Nixon in 1971 also made a diplomatic overture to China. This too sounds kind of trivial if you think that all it involved was Nixon shaking hands with Mao Zedong, but in reality, the establishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and communist China laid the groundwork for China's rise as a manufacturing center and an economic power. And that story could not be more crucial to the way the world works today. Environmentally, 1971 was also a pivot point. You may have heard of Earth Overshoot Day, which is the day in the year in which the human race consumes the amount of resources that the entire Earth can sustain or regenerate in an entire year. 1971 was the first year in human history in which more resources were consumed than the Earth could replenish, meaning environmental degradation from any source, pollution, extractive industries, climate change, whatever. Any, anyway, all of that was now outstripping the capacity of those resources to come back. And 1971 was the first time in which that had happened, and we've been in that position ever since. So anyway, let's get back to Bond. The producers of the Bond series, uh, Broccoli and Saltzman, they decided that they didn't like the bold experiment uh, that had been the previous film on Her Majesty's Secret Service. And they decided basically that they wanted to remake Goldfinger, the most iconic film so far. 
In fact, the early scripts of Diamonds Are Forever involved Goldfinger's twin brother as a villain, and they were even going to cast Gert Frobe, who was the actor who had portrayed Goldfinger back in 1964. But when it started to look like that wasn't going to come off, this idea was changed to a scenario involving a character based on Howard Hughes, who was a prominent figure in pop culture in the 1960s and 70s, mostly because of his eccentricities. Hughes was a millionaire, an industrialist, an aviation pioneer, and even a film director. In 1930, he made the most expensive movie ever up to that point in time called Hell's Angels, and he was probably most famous for building the world's largest airplane, the Hercules Transport, also known as the Spruce Goose, which flew only one time in 1947. In 1966, Hughes, who was mentally ill, moved into a penthouse on the top floor of the Desert Inn Hotel and Resort in Las Vegas, and refused to come out. In fact, to avoid being evicted by the owners, he bought the Desert Inn, specifically so he wouldn't have to come out. Rumors floated throughout the world about Hughes' bizarre behavior, such as saving his own urine in milk bottles or walking around with Kleenex boxes on his feet. Uh, Some of this behavior is dramatized in Martin Scorsese's 2004 biopic, The Aviator, uh, which is a very good film. Anyway, the central idea, the central plot idea of Diamonds Are Forever involves a Hughes-like business magnate, uh, Willard White, who's terribly portrayed uh, by Jimmy Dean, uh, later of sausage fame. Anyway, Willard White is kidnapped by Blofeld, held prisoner, and then Blofeld uses his business empire as a cover for his latest scheme. The scheme, of course, is fantastic and outrageous, uh, using a diamond refracted laser beam uh, satellite to play havoc with the world's nuclear forces. Uh, One of my favorite scenes in the film is uh, a montage of the satellite going around the Earth, blowing up American ICBMs, a Soviet nuclear submarine, and a missile base in Red China, a uh, special effect which is particularly uh, 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 shoddy looking. Uh, But notice China gets a nod here, uh, very topical for 1971. The Las Vegas setting of Diamonds Are Forever is basically an excuse for the film to go absolutely nuts. Uh, Gambling scenes, always a trope of the James Bond films, Uh, glitzy sets designed by Ken Adam, a completely ludicrous car chase, Uh, one of the first examples of product placement in a Bond film. Uh, The Ford Motor Company insisted as a condition of donating cars to the production that James Bond drive a Mustang Mach 1, uh, which is one of their showcase products at the time. There's an amazing crane shot in Diamonds Are Forever that shows what Las Vegas looked like in 1971, and it's really fascinating because the place was so damn small. Today, Vegas is a sprawling metropolis with development everywhere, but in the early 1970s, it was basically just a cluster of a few hotels and casinos on the Strip, uh, with raw open desert around it on all sides. The strip was not very big in 1971, which accounts for why in the Mustang car chase, they just keep going around and around and around the same three or four blocks multiple times. There just wasn't much else there. Of course, the big news in the Bond universe with this film was the return of Sean Connery. After what was perceived as a disaster of casting George Lazenby and after Lazenby quit, Connery reluctantly returned for the role when he was promised a salary of 1.25 million pounds, absolutely astronomical for 1971, and that United Artists would greenlight two films of his choice. In fact, only one of those films ended up being made. Even at that, Connery basically phones in his performance, and physically he looks awful, sporting the early models of the increasingly unrealistic toupees that he would continue wearing through the remainder of his film career. I have to say some words about the rampant homophobia in Diamonds Are Forever. Uh, Two minor uh, henchmen, Wint and Kidd, played uh, by Bruce Glover and Putter Smith, are depicted as gay lovers. Uh, Bruce Glover, of course, is the uh, father of Crispin Glover, most notable for playing uh, George McFly in the Back to the Future, first Back to the Future film. Putter Smith was actually a jazz musician. He was not an actor, uh, but his involvement in the movie is chronicled in a really interesting episode of the podcast I Was There Too, which I highly recommend. Anyway, the film seems to make fun of these two characters uh, in a pretty insensitive manner. And the death scene of the Bruce Glover character in the final scene of the movie is frankly uh, difficult to watch. Bigoted portrayals in movies have a long and depressing history. Uh, Disney's Song of the South, for example, which came out in 1946, 
or Mickey Rooney's unbelievably racist portrayal of Audrey Hepburn's Japanese landlord in Breakfast at Tiffany's, otherwise a very good film. Uh, the homophobia of Diamonds Are Forever is uh, historically important, however, because it was only two years previously, in 1969, that the Stonewall riots in New York City began the modern LGBT rights movement. So, gays, lesbians, bisexuals, tran transgender people were becoming increasingly visible in the early 1970s. It's been extremely rare up until now in the series to see the Bond films making a cultural judgment, but it's very clear that the film wants you to laugh at gay people. If you want to see how things change in the course of the Bond series, compare the homophobia in Diamonds Are Forever to a scene in Skyfall from 2012, where Silva, the villain uh, portrayed by Javier Bardem, uh, the portrayal deliberately suggests that Silva's gay. Uh, the villain actually flirts with Bond, and Bond, played by Daniel Craig at this time, suggests that he has had sex with men. Craig pulls this off brilliantly, and there's a kind of crackly chemistry between him and Javier Bardem, uh, but you could not imagine a moment like that uh, in the uh, Bond films of the early 1970s. Of course, I'll say more about that at the end of the series when I finally get to Skyfall. I've probably gone on too long about this one, but as you can see, there's a lot to unpack around Diamonds Are Forever and a tremendous amount of historical context. So thanks for joining me. Please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you.